The WS2812 RGB LED is a pretty popular device that's been around for a long time. In this video I'll cover what they are, how to drive them from 33 volt logic, and even throw in a simple Golang library to control them from a Raspberry Pi, which will display a count of, what else, Wiffies. What more could you ask? This video is being sponsored by JLC PCB, who provide all my PCBs. JLC PCB can produce one to six layer boards from 0.4 to two millimeters thickness, track widths down to 3.5 mil, via drill size down to 0.2 millimeters, and can handle BGAs, controlled impedance, cutouts, gold fingers, and even offer a panelization service. Even better is that for only $2, you can get 10 PCBs manufactured in 24 hours. And if you haven't used them before, don't forget to claim your $20 shipping coupon off your first order. Click on the link in the description below to check them out. AWS2812 is a small four pin semiconductor that is powered from five volts DC. So of course it has five volts and ground pins for a start, but it also has data in and data out. These last two pins allow each LED to be daisy chained. Serial data coming in one end is buffered and transmitted out the other end. This allows them to be daisy chained to theoretically any length. The serial data is actually a pulse with modulated signal with a typical signal frequency of 800 kilohertz. The PWM signal doesn't need to be repeated for the display to be refreshed because the LEDs will latch onto that state and will only change when a new signal is transmitted. The signal is very time sensitive, any slight delay and it will affect the output. So any MCU or SOC capable of PWM will be able to drive them. When driving a couple of LEDs, you can do it with plain old bit bashing. But when driving thousands, forget doing this in software as these LEDs need to have a pretty reliable timing. You also might have issues when using a non-real-time OS as it will often be busy doing other things like user input. Most people wanting to drive a handful of these use an MCU like one of the Arduino boards, but if you want to drive thousands of LEDs, then you'll need to have a faster MCU like the Teensy. So how many can you drive on one chain? Theoretically, hundreds of thousands, but there are three problems that you'll come across the more LEDs you add. The first is refresh rate. Since this is a serial interface, the more LEDs you add, the longer it takes to refresh all of them. People often call this frame rate. If you want any display animation, then 24 frames per second is the gold standard for humans. If you want to know why, then check out the video in the description below. If you don't want to go below that 24 FPS magic number, then the maximum number of LEDs is 1,388. Of course, if you're not doing any animation, then you could drive 2,000, 4,000, 6,000 in a single strip. However, if you want to have animation on a whole lot of LEDs, you can get around this by segmenting off LED strips. And as long as you have enough CPU grunt behind them, you can drive several chains simultaneously. The Tenzi is one such MCU that can do this well. The second issue is power. The longest LED strip you can buy is around five meters with 300 LEDs. One of the reasons for this is that copper is not a perfect conductor and so has a resistance. This resistance will cause a voltage drop. So by the time you get to the end of a five meter strip, you may have around four volts or even as low as three volts, depending on the quality of the LED strip. Another reason for limiting the length is that each LED will draw up to 60 milliamps when fully on and around one milliamp when off. So an LED strip with 300 LEDs can draw a maximum of 18 amps. This means that the copper tracks at the start of the chain have to be able to cope with 18 amps being shunted through it. Since they are mostly thin copper, they will start to get pretty hot. There is a way around this though. You can segment off each strip and power at intervals, but this only works for matrix displays as you will introduce yet more issues if you use multiple power supplies along the chain. Another way around this is to use a higher voltage and hence a lower current for the strips. 12 volts is the usual standard. These strips also contain small voltage regulators.
with the PWM logic level signal still at 5 volts. So you can get a much longer strip with higher brightness on each LED. The third issue is memory. If you want to keep track of what you are displaying, then you'll of course need to store this somewhere. For an SBC, this is no problem, but for an MCU, it becomes a limiting factor. Each LED adds three bytes of storage since there are red, green, and blue LEDs. Unless your code is very efficient, this will actually use up four bytes of storage per LED. So 300 LEDs requires 1200 bytes of RAM and 1000 LEDs will need 4000 bytes of RAM. Doesn't sound like much, but this is a lot for a small MCU. Apart from those three factors, there's one last thing that you need to consider, and that is interfacing. Most WS2812s will accept only a 5 volt PWM signal, but there are some that will work with 3.3 volt logic levels. Alas, you won't really know until you trial them out. So if you're using 3.3 volt logic levels as in a Raspberry Pi or a lot of the MCUs you get, then you'll need a logic level converter or buffer. There are several ways of doing this, but since this is a unidirectional interface, or one way, it makes things a little easier. The first method is just a plain direct connection, and hope that the WS2812s handle the logic high being at 3.3 volts. Not very reliable, but works sometimes. Method 2 relies on a diode drop. Typically, a logic high will be seen when the PWM voltage hits at least 70% of VCC. If you drop VCC down on the very first LED by inserting a diode, then 5 volts becomes 4.3 volts. That means the 3.3 volt logic high ends up being above the 70% threshold. The first LED will then buffer the signal and retransmit at 5 volt logic levels. So you're essentially using the very first LED as a logic level converter. It's probably the simplest way of doing it, but not reliable in all situations. Another way is to use a diode offset circuit. In this case, the output low voltage is increased by the forward voltage of diode 1, around 0.7 volts. You end up with 1.1 volts on the WS2812, which is still interpreted as a logic low. For a logical high, the resistor and diode 2 will create a voltage at the WS2812 of 0.7 volts above VCC, or 4 volts. This is of course out of spec for the driving side, but if the current is low enough, there shouldn't be any issues. Maybe, sort of, possibly. Who knows? If you're worried about going out of spec, then you could always use a voltage comparator circuit using an op-amp. This simple circuit will drive to ground the output when the inverting input is greater than the non-inverting input. For a logical high, the inverting input will be lower than the non-inverting input. The two resistors set the voltage at which this occurs, so it's a pretty simple setup. You could try and use a classic BSS138 MOSFET as a logic level converter, but these don't really perform well at 800kHz. At most you can get around 200kHz out of them, so are decent enough for low speed I2C and SPI, but not good enough for WS2812 signal speeds. One of the better ways is to use the 74HCT245 analog switch. This IC is not only capable of handling the 800kHz signal frequency, it's a 5V powered IC, but it can handle 3.3V logic levels. So it makes an excellent logic level converter for the WS2812s. Now that you have everything sorted out, there's the software side. Since these LEDs have been around for many years, there's a ton of APIs and libraries for everything from the Arduino IDE, Python, C, C++, C Sharp, Rust, and Golang. Of course, since I'm a Golang fanboy, I'll be using Go on a Raspberry Pi. To be able to use Go, you'll need two libraries. The Raspberry Pi WS2812C library, and the Golang package bindings for that library. If you're a regular viewer of my channel, then you would have seen my latest Maker Speedrun video, where I designed the Pi strip in under a week. As I mentioned in this video, one of the things that was lacking on this board was a buffer. So my RGB LED strip worked okay, but when I started using Xeon 7 segment NeoPixel display, it didn't. I'll be addressing this design flaw in my next version of the PCB, but in the meantime, I needed to breadboard it all up to confirm the design. 
I didn't have any 74 HCT 245s in my stock of components but digging through a bunch of PCBs I eventually found one and soldered it up to a SOIC breakout. I used the PWM interface on the Pi but you can also use the SPI or the PCM interfaces just as well. Writing some simple Golang code I was able to drive them without issue. Scoping out the input and the output, you can see that there is a 15 nanosecond delay between switching with a 42 nanosecond rise time. Pretty good response for an analog switch. So since I had Xeon's NeoPixel 7 segment display up and running, I might as well write some high level code to map text to pixels. I wrote a Golang package similar to Xeon's C++ interface and you can find this on my GitHub page. So there you go, pretty easy. If you're a regular viewer of my channel, then you'll also know about my Wi-Fi problem. And a Wi-Fi and Bluetooth module. It's the MKR Wi-Fi 1010. It's 4 gig DDR3 RAM, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, gigabit, ethernet, ethernet, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, USB 3.0, about to lose. Wiffy boy turns up. <laughs> Wiffy boy? <laughs> yeah, you know, J-Man sidekick. So what's his superpower? Well, he has the power of wireless transmission. This channel has been going on long enough for it to even have its own official Wiffy counter. So instead of using Sion's display to just count subscribers, I reckon I need to count Wiffies. This isn't as complex to do as you might think. To do this, I wrote it in two parts. One part makes the display an MQTT client, so you can publish things like countdown, count up, display text in plain color, or alternating colors. If you want to set up an MQTT server, then check out my QuickBits video on how to do this with a Raspberry Pi. The second part is a Twitter to MQTT interface. There's several ways of doing this. Since I'm using an MQTT client interface, I can use IFTTT to do the interfacing. If you saw my MQTT mailbox project, then you'll see how I did it in that video. But instead I decided to do it another way, which was to have another Golang executable poll Twitter, and if it finds a certain text coming from a certain someone, it'll fire off an MQTT message. I ended up using this Golang package to do this. So every time my official Wi-Fi counter tweets the latest Wi-Fi count, it'll update my display. Later on, I'll add in a reply tweet with a photo taken using the Raspberry Pi camera. The whole thing is driven from a simple JSON config file, which allows me to set the polling rates and login details. It's fairly straightforward code and you'll find it all on my GitHub page, so go and check it out. So there you have it. All I have to do is wait for the next revision of the Pi strip to arrive this week, which not only includes the 74HCT245 analog switch, but a bunch of BS138s breaking out all the Pi's 26 GPIOs onto a 5 volt tolerant Pi header. I'm also making a more expensive version which uses the LSF0108 8 channel logic level converter. These will have signals capable of hitting 100 megahertz. So stay tuned to this channel, my website, or keep an eye on my Tindy store for details. So thanks for watching and see you next week.